I think that a lot of us, as we look at educational reform, are looking for other ways to reach students other than the four walls of the traditional classroom. Students have lots of interests, and the virtual high school will offer them really an opportunity to pursue those interests that they don't always get uh, at the high school itself. Imagine, if you will, a teacher in Forks, Washington, contributing a course to the virtual high school. In exchange, that little school in a town of 3,000 people will have in their course catalog offerings 30 more courses that they didn't have a year ago. That's where the teacher looked at me and said, this is our bridge out of this valley. I was going to take early retirement. When this came along, I said, I'm going to stick with teaching. This is my brain food. This is a project I want to participate in. So when you get a teacher who is teaching what they have a passion about, um, it makes the course very exciting. And you've got kids then that will connect to that excitement. One of the schools that started participating was just going along. And then, unfortunately, they lost their physics teacher. And having been a school administrator, sometimes when you're trying to find the single specialty area, it's real hard. They didn't have to worry about it. We've got a physics course. So all of their students are now in the virtual high school physics course. It's made life in that particular school a lot easier. I'm watching teachers in North Carolina, in Washington State, in Texas, all put themselves out there on the table and ask for critiques from each other. They are collaborating on building individual curricula that span 29 different topical areas. It's not really about technology. Our program uses technology, but we're delivering content. The content is, for the most part, the kinds of things that schools would like to be teaching. I think there are things we're going to be able to do in the virtual high school that could never happen in a regular classroom because when I ask a question of a group of students and those students are living in Alaska, in North Carolina, in Colorado, they're going to bring their responses, their cultural differences, their geographic differences to the discussion, which is going to add for a richness that one just could never get. The Native American course, for example, is fascinating because the instructor there will be having the students research um, Native American history locally where they are and then come back and share that information with the other students in the class. So the students, in a sense, will become partially the teachers too. And now a student in, in New York or in Massachusetts will understand more about local Native American heritage out here in California. It, it doesn't all have to be internet based. It could be go out and interview somebody come back, share with us what that interview is. A lot of what we're trying to do is have these courses act as springboards away from the machines. We don't want this to be, um, well, what some people would call uh, heads down learning. It breaks kids out of the uh, sort of lecture-based situation because they are finally not just sitting and listening, but they're participating, they're doing something. And I think that we all know that when we are actively involved in something, um, the learning sticks. There is no such thing as not participating if you want to be in one of these courses. You cannot sit figuratively in the back of the room and do nothing and pass. Everybody will learn to lead a discussion, to participate in a discussion, to respond, to ask questions. And it can be a very private question. It can be a question that you as a student who are, are, fa who are fairly shy um, don't feel good about raising your hand and speaking out in front of a whole class. And this is really going to encourage um, those kinds of students to, who I think get lost on the outskirts. I've been interested in virtual courses at the high school level to help reach people that have dropped out. It's not going to meet every dropout's needs, but we will reach certain segments of the population with the technology. Part of the challenge has been that school boards and school administrations have said, how do I know they're there? You know, and it gets down to, well, we can see if they've logged on or not. Well, what if they log on and then go out for a glass of water and stay on? Well, that's 
part and parcel of this project. Um, it's going to be calling for a different kind of learning and a different kind of assessment. I think we'll see as students move through the grades and uh, up into high school, we'll find more portfolio-based electronic assessment. Some of those electronic portfolios will go with them, um, not a, as a judged assessment, but as a way to have a continuum in their learning. This is certainly nothing that will ever be a substitute for bricks and mortar schools. A girl speaking at a uh, gathering of uh, educators in Washington, D.C. last fall actually said it wonderfully. She said, folks, computers are never going to be take over teachers. She said, but teachers who understand technology will replace teachers who don't.